I just took my, my students to CERN. We went to Switzerland and I could, took them to see CERN at the Large Hadron Collider. Really? Which is quite funny. That, that is a hell of a trip for an architecture student. Well, I mean, this, the, the guy showing us around, they do these organized trips. Um, but the guy was the, I mean, the stereotypical English eccentric physicist. Yeah. And I said to him at the start, I said, look, I said, you know, we're not, we're not scientists. These are sort of A-level a at best. Uh, and I said, you're going to have to try and put this into layman's terms. And this guy just, they just couldn't do it. You know, it's the level of complexity that they're talking about working at to a bunch of sort of Asian students that barely speak English anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was kind of trying to follow it. You know, I'm interested in that stuff anyway. But I was just looking around at their faces. And when they started talking about antimatter, I could just see these like blank faces <laughs> trying to Google translate antimatter and these things. It was, uh, yeah, yeah. it's a good trip though, definitely. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting that you're taking them there. Because it's there's obviously there's more and more of an integration of science, especially at the Bartlett, yeah. in into architecture. Um, so moving on to your work mm. in terms of the sort of the biological side of things, is that to what extent do you think that's increasingly becoming part of architecture? Uh, I mean, ever more so. I mean, I think biology is the sort of the you know I think if you go back to the to the 19th century, 20th century, it was all chemistry, but now is the time of biology and. The point is, I think when we talk about interdisciplinary work, um, you know, you can't do a lot of this stuff on your own. So you need to work with biologists. And so interdisciplinary or interdisciplinarity is being talked about a lot. Um, but ways to explore it through through the work is really coming through literal interdisciplinary work of working with a scientist to be able to do that. And that's becoming more common, um, certainly within the work that we're doing, which has the bio agenda. But obviously it can be much wider than that. But yeah, again, it, it's something that it needs it needs the knowledge from both sides to be able to do it, and you can't do it all on your own. You know, we can have a good understanding of some of these principles, but you need to work with others, I think, to do it. Yeah, and do you think there's a... I mean, you talk about students not having the, the capacity to understand what it is they're looking at in terms of physics. Do you think there's enough of a, a scientific understanding within most architecture students, as first of all, when they join an architecture school and as they move through it? Not really, but why? But why should they have? You know, it's uh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure many of the students coming to the school at our level of of masters are, are really coming with a sense that they're going to do some kind of biological integrated design. I think, especially on the post professional masters courses, they're coming to the Bartlett as as designers and architects, and then they're mm. finding out about this stuff when they get here. I mean, it would be great if yeah, if some of them already had that background, and some do, but there's no there's no guarantees. So I'd say the knowledge generally is is pretty low, but probably yeah. that's probably how it should be. But it, yeah, exactly. Is that is it only low to the extent that an architect's knowledge is low generally of all disciplines, but that's not what an architect is. An architect is a generalist, effectively, I mean, and I doesn't need to know loads about one specific area necessarily. Yeah, I think so. And and the the projects become very specific anyway and so the students can can cope with learning a very specific part of that without having to have a hugely broad range background right yeah no i think that's definitely true but do you, do you see more of them then in applying real science to their projects even in an academic context i'm still not even sure it's it's real science you know i think it depends it depends how you discuss these disciplines i think it's it's about approaching and trying to use some scientific methodologies but without forgetting that at the end of the day, you're a designer. If you try to do too much of the science, ultimately, I think it stops them designing mm. because you can become obsessed with it, right? You become ingrained with this sort of met methodological, repetitive testing, and you never get around to designing anything because there's always more testing to do, right? There's always <laughs> another duplicate and more than another triplicate to do. And, and we've, we've seen it actually in some of the projects when you focus too much on that, the design becomes secondary and that's the problem it needs to be the other way it needs to still be led by design using design methodologies but in, in a way you're feeding in some of these scientific approaches even though probably to the strict sciences that it's, it's not done to the level really needed for scientific research yeah i mean even just the ability to read a scientific paper and understand it is quite a sort of a learned skill really isn't it well i mean that's one of the things we focus on initially is, is being able to read these papers you know and it's a case of starting with the abstracts and then starting to look a bit deeper into the into the into the results, but with a, you know and understanding what they're summarising without really understanding that the methodologies or the particular types of equipment that they're using. Right, it's not really about them doing that. That's the job of the scientists. It's how do you how do you look at the data and the kind of results they're getting, and then use that as a way to start to understand your design decisions. 
Yeah. No, I think it's definitely good that the, the Bartlett and various schools, I suppose, are doing that. Although I suppose the Bartlett's probably doing it more than anyone else. Um, but in terms of your own work and in, in how it relates to science and to architecture, can you just tell, tell us a little bit about what it is that you're researching um, and how that applies to architecture? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in the broadest sense, it was always the integration of biology and biotechnology and architecture and what that meant from a, from a contemporary architectural point of view. And I think when I started, when I started my part two at the Bartlett, there was uh, Marcos Cruz, who was my tutor at the time, was someone who'd been looking at this stuff. Uh, and he had a book out at the time called Neoplasmatic, which was Neoplasmatic Design, which was one of the AD books. And he had just these you know, at the time, these weird projects that some of them had bacteria, some of them have growing things, some of them had skin and flesh, which relates a bit to Marcus's kind of background and PhD. And it was just, it was just sort of fascinating to me. And I had a, I had a science background. In fact, I had more of a science background than a design background at the time, actually. Um, and so I think when I when I first got into it, it was it was just a case of something to do with biology and something to do with living things and integrating that into architecture. Um, and how that's kind of evolved over the years, um, working with Marcus, is that it, we, I guess we were looking at ways we could directly integrate living systems into architecture. So it wasn't just about producing imagery that looked biological or geometrical languages that mimicked biology or living systems, but how could we actually really put living things into architecture? Mm. Well, I think that that's a, a core difference and distinction, isn't it, between sort of biomimicry and bio receptivity yeah. or, or and I, I think I, I sort of looking back at the history of it you get um, the impression in the sort of in the 90s where you have blob architecture kind of thing mm. and future systems that that kind of thing and parametrics starting to exist you get this very strong biomimicry in terms of forms but not necessarily an integration of the systems yeah so do you think there's and, and that, that I think is still going on to a very large extent like what why do you think it is that people engage so much with biomimicry seemingly but so little with the actual integration of biological systems i mean i think just biomimicry is something that the aesthetics of it is something you either tend to like or you don't some people don't like a biological language because it can look a bit gross funny some people just like it and you know i think the the, the reason that has become so popular is because it was led through software and so people could pick up and learn various softwares that allowed them to explore these languages. And that, that came very on through, through sort of physical modeling software, such as Maya 3D Max, where you could actually soft model geometries in, in the same way as you might work with clay to produce things that weren't hard edged and, and looked in a way biological. And I think as software has developed, the, these uh, various softwares have become driven to do this in a much more algorithmic way. And so the idea of integrating sort of math principles of morphogenesis and things like that, and you can actually now run these in software programs to uh, use various algorithms to produce biological looking things. And so people have been keen to explore that. I think the reason that the, the integration of, of real living systems is, is behind that is because it's just so much harder to do. It's just not something you can necessarily just start to do one day in the same way you can just download some software and start to play with the algorithms, right, in a tinkering kind mm. of way. I think the actual integration side requires, well, it certainly requires a level of knowledge, but it also requires equipment. It requires laboratory facilities. And there, there has been a a movement that's a bit similar to the sort of biohacking thing where you know a lot of this stuff has tried to be taken out of the lab and and encourage people to do it at home but there still is a, a level of information knowledge and equipment you need to even start and that's mm. that's very hard just to do just one day because you decided to do it well i think you're definitely right in terms of sort of the proper integration and understanding of a of a complex biological system but i i would suggest that you don't necessarily have to take it into that level of complexity. But like even really basic stuff like guerrilla gardening mm. or, or having plants on your building or allowing designing your, your uh, building in such a way that it is receptive to biological systems that exist in the context anyway. Yep. Now, surely that, that's the sort of starting point so far as I see it. And you don't need necessarily to understand exactly how the systems that you're trying to encourage work. You can just sort of say, well, I'm going to do that. Let's see if it's adopted, say, by yeah. the local ecology. Hmm. Um, so it, it's, I think what, what you seem to be doing is, is a much sort of deeper understand, level of understanding of these systems, um, which is really important. But do you think there needs to be more of an encouragement 
of people or a less maybe less of a frightening away of people um by showing them that it doesn't have to be that way it doesn't have to be that complex it can be simple yeah definitely i mean i think when, when we started a lot of this work i mean it, we were using that simple observational way of testing these things i mean literally trying things putting them out there and testing them and seeing what happens and you know growth when we talk about growth of sort of green species algae lichens and mosses these the so-called like um cryptogams <clears throat> Uh, you know they exist everywhere right they already exist out and around and once you start it's like anything once you start looking for them you'll see them everywhere and you know they exist everywhere they they are more apparent at certain times of the year because of the climate because of you know certain conditions um and so that kind of observational approach works works absolutely very well and yeah if you if you wanted to design a building that had greenery growing on it i mean just from looking around you'd kind of work out that it doesn't happen on every facade right a north and slightly east facing facade is going to be better for green growth than a southwest facing facade so these kind of you know you don't need a huge scientific understanding from that it's just what people have done over the years is just to to observe this stuff and, and work out what's going on and we spent a lot of time looking at tree barks for example and the tree barks are really interesting condition because it's a it's a 360 degree orientation condition when you look at these various barks you realize that growth is happening on them and it's happening in in very specific uh, patterns and stripes. So you get clearly get a moss stripe growing on a tree, and then that turns into a, a lichen stripe, and that turns into a an algae stripe. And it's all to do with orientation, how water's moving. And so that was very much very much how we how we did these things was through observation, and then trying to sort of apply that. But then comes the the, the idea of how how much do you want to design this growth? on your buildings do you just want some greenery there and that's okay or do you want to start actually designing for it to happen um, as either a time-based system or as a, as a specific having specific growth areas well then you do need i think to start understanding the species the species and the living systems in a, in a bit more of a, a a deep way because stuff does just happen but if you want to define where it happens you need to understand what those conditions are mm. Well, is there is there going increasingly going to be a role for a sort of consultant biologist within mm. architectural projects? Who, yeah, I think so. Who yeah. deals with the integration of these sorts of systems? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's definitely, a, I think, an increasing, increasingly important area uh, in architecture. But in terms in terms of the sort of the stylistic side again, in the in the sort of on the bio, biomimicry and as how it's emerged, do you think that's done damage? in a way to the idea of a biological architectural biology and architecture because it's become this sort of fad almost <laughs> now after after so many years of people messing around with the software that people a lot of architects make jokes about oh it's just sort of cheap biomimicry kind of thing yeah i think it's a valid criticism um i mean i, uh, I guess from from the terms of of what we're doing and having achieving growth and having living systems i mean it uh, funnily enough you don't need biomimetic geometries underpinning that right in in many ways you know take algae for example algae doesn't care what kind of geometry it's growing on but there are certain types of geometries that act as a scaffold and as a supporting geometry underneath it that can uh, control i guess in a way of how the growth looks because what, what we do know is that growth happening on flat very flat surfaces and if you take you know the the, the generally accepted term of modernism of the, as the flat white wall we know that when we get growth on that and i'm talking about green algae stripes and stains and patches it looks terrible and, and people mm. want to clean that off right they, they don't like that look whereas what we have found is that softer uh, more undulating geometries and i'm not necessarily saying biological here i'm just I, I guess i'm just saying in opposition to the the flat pristine clean white surfaces that softer geometries with folds and and underhangs that create actually what are called microclimates actually support growth better because growth and, and living things don't exist as a continuous thing right they change throughout the year they change seasonally they change throughout the course of the day even sometimes growth is green and lush sometimes growth is brown and desiccated and you know accepting that and and kind of trying to move away from this green lawn condition where you say i want my building to be lush green you know all year round well nature's not like that nature doesn't do that um and so why should we expect it to and so it's actually the geometries under underpinning some of this growth do play a role when growth is slow and desiccated because they become more apparent then mm. and it, what it what we've noticed is is that when growth looks patchy 
it doesn't look designed and it doesn't like doesn't look controlled and people don't like it so there is a role for geometry but it doesn't necessarily have to be biological mm. and whether biological geometries are a fad yeah I, I i think i do do agree with that criticism but inherently we are interested in geometrical complexities that come from biology which you could argue is biomimicry but there is a, a role to play with transition and how you achieve growth in certain areas and not in other areas yeah well i think there's the key point that's an obvious illustration of this is how gen more historical buildings that have external ornament on them a lot more of do age very well when they're sort of um occupied by mosses or, or lichens or any form of, of biological sort of attachment if you like yeah um and sort of people come to love that. They come to love the sort of the the old brick wall covered in moss or the the sort of nicely stained uh, ornamental stone facade or whatever it is. Um, and I think you're right that you don't necessarily need biological forms and ornaments for bio bioreceptivity effectively, do you? you but the, the the complexity, the formal complexity of it creates conditions that are more conducive to that looking good um, and indeed working better through microclimates <clears throat> and that sort of thing. Um, so is it? do we have to perhaps decouple that idea that you have to have the sort of bioreceptivity and biomimicry have to be linked? Can you sort of take an, any form of architecture that doesn't look in any way futuristic or biological and apply principles of bioreceptivity to that. Yeah, I think we can. I think we can. I mean, I think the the, the material condition is it plays a big part of that. Um, as I said, the, the the geometry, the underlying geometries of of the architecture itself is more about creating what they call niches, right? Biological niches, um, and you can tr can control that, right? You can use software to uh, uh, simulate for example environmental conditions sun paths wind directions and you can understand those conditions and feed that into the geometry and language of your building but again it's it's something that i, I think needs a, a level of geometric complexity and nuances within it to to do this in a way that the growth doesn't look like a mistake mm. well that's sort of in terms of the generation of those sorts of forms is that perhaps where the algorithms do have a role? I mean, you you did a lot of work on this with the panels, the mm. recept bioreceptive panels, that can you use the technology rather than merely to create forms to actually create the optimum conditions for uh, biology to exist in harmony with the with the architecture? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we I think as, as part of the bioreceptive design work, we, we never saw it as this engineered approach to optimizing growth. We never said that we wanted every part of the building to have growth on it actually the areas where there is no growth is just as important as the areas where there are growth um, and that again i think comes down to what people accept uh, on buildings as a level of growth where it's not a problem when it's happening everywhere and it's it funny it looks out of control people don't feel so comfortable with that whereas actually quite clearly defined non-growth areas kind of gives gives people a sense that it's designed and again you can control you can control those growth through geometry but also through material conditions and i'm talking about chemical and physical properties of the materials mm. so there's many ways you can play with this through texture as well as you know the hard geometry yeah i mean the classic example that comes to mind if you think of a, a sort of a, an overgrown <laughs> meadow looks sort of kind of nice but messy mm. but in the moment you mow a perfectly straight path through the middle of it yeah with a with a standard sort of height it suddenly looks designed and yeah, looks yeah. like it's meant to be there and it's encouraging to see more councils are doing that sort of setting aside areas um for messy growth if you like yes but i mean you mentioned sort of pristine grass lawns earlier do you think there's a sort of socio-cultural obsession with neatness and organization and we need to sort of teach people to be more comfortable with messiness yeah i think there absolutely is i mean neatness cleanliness i mean a lot of people would argue that this is all modernist thinking right that the clean lines and and people definitely do have a preference from that and, and funnily we we tried our lawn as a sort of meadow lawn for a while and when we just left it i mean it we liked it but it looked terrible and actually we felt more bad for the neighbors having to look out so we actually yeah we, we kind of mowed a strip around it so you had this kind of wildness but it was it had a it had a border and actually this this border condition has, has been something that's been really interesting to us and something we've explored through the gardening condition Mm. Um, as well as the hard sort of geometrical borders of, that we can have in architecture, and yeah, I, I think I think we do need to we do need to shift our, uh, our thoughts on this because again, you know, 
nature is not a standard condition. It changes all the time and it can't always be this perfectly pristine maintained thing because then you get into the real uh, sort of notion of the real garden, which basically relies on a huge amount of maintenance and upkeep to do that. And obviously that becomes expensive. And at the moment, you know, maintenance of buildings is expensive enough anyway, with them now having to then factor in an extra budget to maintain your facade. Now we can, yes, we can change thinking on it, but we need to do it in intelligent ways where it doesn't need somebody out there every day in the same way as like a, a you know, a very manicured garden in a, in a stately home. I'm not sure that can work on, a, on an urban scale. I don't think we can mm. really have people out there every day maintaining a facade. So I think our approach to this has been where we have to accept nature for what it is, but can we design it in an intelligent way where it doesn't need everyday maintenance? Yeah. Was well, there a role for resilience in architecture in that respect that you need to design buildings in, in a much more much less fragile way effectively so that they can deal with um with biological elements adapting to them taking advantage of them um and applying themselves to them without falling apart without falling to pieces and without yeah. needing maintenance yeah i think it's a really interesting point and the ability of architecture to be able to cope with changes too and if we you know obviously we're driven by climatic change at the moment and in many ways some of our buildings are not particularly resilient to climate and actually building that resilience into buildings for, for me is a very important thing mm. Uh, and we're sort of we're slating modernism to some extent, but if if I'm not mistaken, it was on the Villa Savoir with Cavusier where he wanted to put the the garden effectively on the roof in order to maintain that sort of biological loss effectively that you get from the footprint of the building. But is is there? I've always thought is there a role where rather than merely replacing a footprint with a roof space, say, what you're actually doing is you're gaining a vast amount of surface area when you're creating a building, yep. especially if it's highly ornamented. Is that sort of the perfect opportunity for allowing that to become a bioscaffold and actually increasing the amount of biology um, biodiversity on a site yeah. rather than decreasing it. Yeah, well, I think that was that was a, a sort of general strategy in that the, the green roof became, was the sort of first attempt at greening buildings, really. When we talked about greening our cities, the green roof was, was the first one. And they, they became very popular and they're, you know, they're, they're probably much more popular than the green walls, the verticals. And I think there's a number of reasons for that of which we can, we can talk about. But yeah, absolutely. Using the building fabric was was the next step after roofs as, as to say, can we use this as a productive surface, right? Does our architecture or can our architecture be productive in terms of biodiversity, greenery, whatever? Um, it, it has its challenges over roofs because because of the verticality. You're dealing suddenly with gravity, water maintenance, or holding on to water is a big problem. If you want growth to happen, you need some moisture there. And on a vertical facade, obviously the water wants to run down. And so there are there are challenges to overcome in, in holding the water. Um, but I think, sorry, I've been a bit thrown off by the cat now. It's just <laughs> they always interrupt. Came in sort of looking at me. <clears throat> what was it we were? The, uh, green roofs and facades and uh, surface area of buildings. Yeah, ex exactly. And the, it's good that you mentioned the surface area principle because, again, you know, a, a very flat surface has less area than a very uh, complex three-dimensional geometrical surface area. And when we're talking about growth, especially of stuff like algae, um, you know, algae is single-celled organisms, microscopic, yet when you maximize the surface area, we, we, we worked out on some of our panels that our most complex three-dimensional panels had something like 12 times more surface area than than an existing flat panel mm. what that what how many more cells basically can you grow on that and, it, and it's a huge number and again not that we were ever interested in the engineering approach to this to say you know on one square meter of panel we can grow x number of algae cells and that means x number of carbon we, we were never doing it from that point of view but in in general maximizing the surface area means you can get more growth yeah well it seems to me it's going again back to green roofs that the the attempts that are made at biological integration or green roofs or anything like that are so minimal and so defined and so framed if you like mm. that they form just a tiny tiny percentage of the potential area on a building yeah um and the I mean, and i've encountered this in regulations things like the amount of distance you need to leave at the edge of a green roof to the edge mm. and which is why you get all that stupid gravel strip around the edge every time which looks just completely fake <laughs> whereas whereas you look at something like a um a viking or icelandic uh grass hut where yeah. everything's overflowing goes right up to the edge completely integrated into the environment 
which looks far less artificial mm -hmm. and is far less artificial as well as providing more surface area. So is there, do you think there are any sort of regulations or any specific, any specific problems that the industry has or perceives with biological integration in architecture that need to be addressed before it can sort of maximize its potential? Possibly. I'm not sure that's really what's holding it back, to be honest. I, I honestly think it's more cost, really, that's that's holding them back. I mean, we see green walls around the world, but we don't see that many of them, funnily. And I, and I think it really is to do with cost and it's to do with the, the maintenance issue in that these big plant walls need really need a huge amount of water to maintain them like that. So it's it. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily regulations holding it back, but it's it's about the way that we're designing them at the moment that are stopping them becoming more widespread. Mm. And again, when you you know when you look at images uh, coming from sort of academia and things, I mean, we we we've seen the biophilic city, right, where there's there's images of a of a city or an urban area that's just covered in green. But the reality is, our cities are not like that. Um, in fact, they're far from that. And and what why are they not? Because I think green walls are fairly universally liked, aren't they? There's not many people that don't like green walls, whether they actually want it on their building, on their on their house is a different matter, but most people tend to like them. So why why haven't they become much more widespread than they are? And I think the cost the cost really is is the driving issue. Yeah, well, also the complexity. Like I've I've always thought that they're the sort of the fundamental philosophy behind a green wall is flawed in that you're trying to artificially create an environment based on man made systems that are incredibly complex and incredibly fragile to put these plants in places where they wouldn't normally exist, where they're not evolved to exist, and where you have to constantly be pumping them full of water and nutrients, and it's basically a hydroponic system in, yep. a, in a large way. And that you're sort of fighting a losing battle. Whereas green walls have already always existed, they're just normally made of climbing plants, and they exist on sort of 15th century mansions that have had some wisteria or something growing up them for the yep. last 100 years. And you get the entire building covered in this plant that needs no watering itself. It's perfectly resilient, exists through all normal conditions. Yep. But people seem to have sort of missed a trick in that way, that they're, they're trying to go around nature rather than using nature in the way that it's sort of evolved to be used. Well, I think it comes back to that that notion of, of observation. And I think you're right. It's about observing when nature is, well, na nature finds its niches, right? Everything will find its niche to grow. And it's about observing those and then understanding why is that niche there for that particular type of species. And when, yeah, when you put all sorts of green plants on the side of a building, they wouldn't normally do that. And so you do fall into then this kind of top-down control system and it becomes a quite an integrated system of hydroponics and other things that, that you mention and yeah it's ultimately these systems use a lot of energy and that's never going to be a long-term sustainable way of doing it so you're absolutely right in that we should be doing it the other way where you observe where things are growing naturally and then ask why they're doing that and then try to integrate that as a bottom-up approach to to achieve it and so yeah you know even in Dubai, you see green walls, right? And it's the it's the antithesis of it because the amount of water they need there to to get them to survive mm. is is insane. Um, but even in even in the UK, you know, where we get a fairly moist climate and we get a lot of growth anyway, it's still quite hard. It still quite takes a lot to maintain a green wall all year. So I th I think your 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 point about that is is right, and we need to be much more uh, under. This is why we need to understand the system so that you can observe where it's happening why it's happening and then design up from that point yeah and one of the best examples i've seen is in las vegas we know you know a lot of americans love their perfect grass mm. uh front lawns with the sprinklers going constantly and there's increasingly more of them are being uh, replaced or the owners are replacing them with effectively desert gardens right so you have a sort of dusty slightly rocky landscape with cactuses yep. and all these sorts of things over it which is the natural environment which is what should be there yeah and interestingly there's now a because because of the sort of high regard for sustainability within especially within high income circles there's a, a social pressure coming about where people who still have the green lawns are being ostracized yep. uh, and looked down upon by the people with the sort of nice sustainable desert gardens yep. uh, which is which is good i guess it's exactly the sort of pressure you want people to be thinking about yeah but there was a there was a case as well was that in in certain states in america where there were actually companies that would come out and spray your lawn green in some of the some of the, the drought times <laughs> Well, that's the, that's the other thing, isn't it? I'm seeing more and more use of fake grass, especially in London and yep, yep. sort of roof gardens and courtyard gardens. Yeah, and it's it always reminds me of the um, 
was it the Lorax film where you got all the fake trees and fake right. plants and everything? Yeah. And uh, I think there's there's almost a danger that we end up going down this sort of artificial route, yeah. rather because it's easier, rather than integrating real natural systems into our own yeah. sort of systems, effectively. Well, I mean that's why that's why when the work we did on bioreceptive design, we were looking at these kind of quite simple species cryptogams, which which tend to grow in most places anyway because they're you know they're not as big as plants they don't need as much water they don't need deep soil that's another you know another problem with having sort of vertical walls is you can't have deep soil beds in there so it's, it's about looking at the type of species that can grow in those conditions anyway uh, because you know mosses for example don't have big long roots they have these kind of smaller um, systems that can all they need is a bit of substrate to be able to cling on to to hold on to and, and then they can get going and so designing that surface texture of roughness into a building is essential if you want moss to grow on it but it's again it's different from the garden approach where you might select seven or eight types of species that you want to grow and then just put them into a into a soil bed and, and keep watering them yeah well do you see i mean you're obviously researching <laughs> algae as the as your main focus do you see algal systems being able to be integrated into real buildings um, in a practical or useful way? I'm not sure. I mean, I'd like to say yes. There was there was a really interesting building done in Hamburg. Um, it was called the BIQ House. Um, and it, it was led by uh, a couple of teams, but Arup were involved in it. And it was it was taking a bit the laboratory condition of a, of a what's called a bioreactor. And so when, when people grow algae in laboratories, they isolate a strain of algae or a species of algae. Um, and they kind of grow it in laboratory conditions, which usually means in a Petri dish, right, in a, in a container. And they give it water and they give it nutrients and they agitate it on a shaker so that they, the cells don't all stick together. And that's how that's how you can grow algae. You can grow them very efficiently. Um, now, when you try to do that in a building, um, what's the route? Do you just scale that up? Do you take the sort of biotech approach of the, of the single strain of algae and scale it up and put it on a building? And actually, they did this in, in Hamburg and it's called, yeah, it's called the BIQ house. And it's effectively got big algal flat panel bioreactors on the building and they feed the flue gases of the building in there which gives the the algae a carbon source of which the, they can then uh, metabolize and produce oxygen and it was a great step to do it um, but a it was probably a very engineering led project um, it doesn't look it doesn't look like an architect might have designed it <laughs> um, and, and uh, for me it's that question I'm, I'm not sure this <clears throat> excuse me I'm not sure this scaling up of the laboratory um, the laboratory approach works because you still need huge amounts of energy to pump the water around. These things are still big containers on the building. Um, and there's still a sense that, you know, architecture is for people and how do you integrate this with, with the people living there? And that, that project probably lacks a bit of integration between the actual residential units and residential building, mm. and residential units and the actual panels on the, on the building. So there, there's there's quite a separation at the moment. So it's almost like taking a laboratory and putting it onto a building. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a great experiment and it was a fantastic thing, but I'm not sure it's the, we, we can do this in cities, right? This can't happen on every other building. So we have to, we have to think about how we do it. And, and yeah, it's not the literal scale up of the Petri dish. We have, we have to look at other ways and again coming back to the observational thing we have to look how this stuff happens naturally and, and design up for it yeah well there's obviously there's an increasing focus in planning terms on um like uh, biodiversity and assessments that kind of thing environmental assessments is it do you think in terms of the sort of the planning side of it that we need to be thinking about how the local natural environment in a development or around a development would integrate with that development or even how that a, a development can improve the levels of biodiversity in a particular setting and i i, I know you've sort of you've dealt with algae do you think there's a role for bioreceptivity moving up the sort of scale spectrum into larger plants larger animals even up to the largest sort of megafauna kind of animals <laughs> well there are things like deer and yeah. you know is there a way? Is there sort of scope for architecture to have a role in taking that sort of spectrum of, of biological integration into account? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how, how well I can answer that on the on the larger side of things. A lot of the stuff we've always looked at is down at the kind of micro scale. Um, there's, there's a fascinating uh, film on on YouTube, and I, I I don't think I'll be able to to reference it here, but it it shows a a natural area and what happens to the natural area when they reinstate the wolf. 
into this area. And so what, what you happen is you had an existing condition where the deer there had no natural predator. So the deer were the dominant species. When they brought the wolf back in, that brought the deer numbers down, which then meant less of the scrubland was getting eaten by the deer. So the actual, the landscape started changing. And it shows you how, it, how just the introduce, introduction of one species changed the whole landscape, even down to the rivers started re-diverting. Yeah, well, it was, um, was it either Yellowstone or Yosemite, wasn't it? I think. Might have been, yeah. It's I, a rewild. Well, it's, 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 it's to do with rewilding. Yeah, well, this is, I'm really interested in rewilding as a concept. Concept. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a project down in Sussex called NEP NEP Estate. Right. Where they've done pretty much exactly this, and they've given up sort of um, standard farming in favour of returning the entire system to yeah. a, a sort of natural landscape, effectively. Um, and I'm I'm sort of curious about how architecture could integrate or contribute to that. Mm. And obviously, it's more it's easier in an, a rural context than yep. it is in an yep. urban context. And I mean, you look at uh, sort of looking around central London, for example, you see very little biological integration, but then a, a very strong use of biology in design terms in the use of parks and squares and that yeah. kind of thing and large trees. Um, so do you think it's ever possible for an actual city to have sustainable ecological systems sort of operating in and around and through it? I do. Yeah, it would, it would take quite a mindset change, wouldn't it? But, but I definitely do. And to, to bring us back a bit to the, to the microbiology, the, the, the rewilding happens at, at every level. You know, nature doesn't exist on, on, on one particular scale. So, okay, we might not necessarily start integrating wolves back into our cities, <laughs> but we might start to encourage more certain types of bacteria and things like that in our cities. We, I think this, this obsession with cleanliness, which again, t tended to come from modernism. It came, came from a time where there was a kind of hygiene movement um, that, that sort of changed people's perceptions of, of cleanliness and health. And people were always worried about dirty, meaning they were going to get ill. And I think we've we've sort of come through that so far. And, and it, it's a bit easy to say now we're too clean nowadays. But in, in many ways we are. But I don't mean literally. I mean, we, we, look, we definitely need to be hygienic. We definitely need to wash our hands. But this, this sterile condition of what our urban environments have become um, is, is not a good thing. And there's a, obviously a lot of this, and when you talk about your planning stuff, a lot of it is led still at the moment by the notions of climate, which of course is very, very important. But biodiversity is, is wider than that. And I think there's, there's a much more interesting relationship to do with health and how people uh, actually need this kind of natural environment. And again, I'm talking from the bacteria up. Um, and, and that's what needs to change. So it, it is about accepting nature back into our cities. But also it's it's kind of changing a bit our, our notions of the sterility and the cleanliness of what we accept and what we want our cities to be. So do our cities need to start looking like rural environments? No, that's not going to happen. But there are, there are ways that we might reconsider our cities from this point of view. Mm. Well, in terms of the sort of cleanliness side, there's so much evidence now that actually having more exposure to, for example, a wider range of microbes is actually much better for our health. Yeah than sort of spraying Dettol everywhere and trying to keep everything super clean. There's some really interesting studies in, in the States. There's so this notion of the what's called the human microbiome. I don't know if you've heard this term. It's, yeah. it's become quite popular across a, a range of disciplines. But the idea that over 50% of our cells are non-human, right? So this, this microbiome, many of our cells are bacterial, fungus, uh, viruses, all, the, all these things. Um, and they did some really interesting studies on, in some of the Amish communities in America and found that Many of these Am Amish communities, the children, they have the lowest rates of asthma and autoimmune illness. And they, they pretty much say it's because they grew up next to farms, to animals and to the rural environment. And the, the problem is, is as we as our cities have become more and more sterile in that sense, and, and we can talk about sterility on, on, on a few levels, what we are seeing nowadays, although we're much more hygienic and, you know, infection's not so much of a problem now because we have antibiotics, but what we are seeing is stuff like autoimmune illness and obesity and these things are because we live very sterile lives. And again, not sterile to do with, with cleanliness of washing your hands, but sterility in, in that we don't have daily exposure to greenery. Right? Some, some of us now spend 95% of our day indoors. Okay. And when you're living in a very urban environment, you, you get up in your house, you go to work, so you get there on the tube or the bus, you spend all day in your office or, or workplace, and then you go home. And so on a day-to-day -day level, you're only ever really being exposed to sort of indoor urban environments, and that's becoming a problem. And sterility as well is about an aesthetic sterility of if you're only exposed to uh, 
the notion of the grey urban environment, you're even missing out on the day-to-day -day changes of nature. So you have this sterility from a from a sort of microbial point of view, but also on an aesthetic point of view. And you know, I think it's it's rethinking our cities that way rather than talking about them necessarily as having green everywhere. I'm not sure our, our cities will be this biophilic green everywhere cities, but more of a, an acceptance that nature is essential to our health and how can we in incorporate and accept them back into our cities. Mm. I suppose that's taking the systemic approach, isn't it, rather than the purely aesthetic approach. Mm. That just because just you had green everywhere doesn't necessarily mean it's sort of healthy in, in yeah. a way. And equally the other way around, you don't have to have green everywhere to make it more healthy. I mean, the, the example that comes to mind for me recently is the increasing prevalence of LED street lights mm. all over the place, especially down, down my road where you to walking along in the middle of the night and it feels like you're in a football pit yeah and i think and that's just completely against the way that sort of the circadian rhythms and nature works i think it was in the netherlands they did an experiment where they replaced all the led street lights with red lights which is like the least effective to the spectrum that most most animals can see and it completely changed the ecology of the entire area mm. And the sort of everything started returning, and birds started singing at the right times rather than at stupid times, and it's 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 that kind of thinking. But what is it that you think that's causing this this misreading of biology, and and for for people at the sort of political level, I guess, of making these decisions, not to get the importance of integration of nature into our cities? Uh, so it's a tough question. I'm not sure. Um... I don't know. I don't know if it's more just integrate into sort of the, the Western lifestyle, the Western urban lifestyles, and, and what what we you know because because we went through a stage where infection was solved by antibiotics. You know, we didn't need to consider buildings as 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 healthy spaces anymore. You know, there was there was a big movement in modernism, um, probably before we really knew about germ theory. Actually, I mean, I think I think there was a period of time when buildings were designed on the notion of health being related to smell it was called miasma theory um, and there were a lot of decisions made and, and Florence Nightingale was a big driver of this at the time that buildings needed like cross ventilation and hospitals shouldn't be overcrowded with too many beds because infection happened but then we went through this medical development of antibiotics and it meant we, we stopped having to worry about health on a day-to-day -day level and so our attentions changed to other things and I think from that point really that the switch to a sort of more mechanized hygiene maybe we could use sort of technology such as hvac and, and and things like that to climatically control our buildings and then climate change has driven us even more to this notion of completely sealed buildings because it's all driven by an energy efficiency but it's like we've forgotten the whole integration with nature even so much as like i mean the buildings at the bartley you can't really even open the windows so actually the notion of a, of a, of a breeze coming in does, doesn't exist in our building and even that relationship with feeling the breeze let alone that it might potentially be bringing in good kind of species and things from outside. So I, I, I don't know what it, it is, but it, it almost needs a, a cultural change mm. of, of what we are doing. And that's such a tough thing to say because the climate is obviously such a pressing concern for us. But I do think that because that's become our, our driver over the last sort of 10, 15 years that we've forgotten a lot of other principles of, of what it is to have a healthy space indoors. Yeah. Well, it's it's an interesting problem because obviously in, with increasing urbanisation, it's not you can't just sort of argue that oh everyone should spend loads more time out in nature, in the countryside. Like yeah, that would be great, but most like you say, most people spend ninety to five percent of their time indoors or mm. or almost all of their time in cities. So we have to sort of think about how we can replicate the effects of being in a natural environment in an urban environment. Yeah, and it's. I don't know what it is that's different now about how people are interacting compared to, say, 100 years ago. Maybe it's just a question of degree or some. I don't know. But it, how do we almost turn cities back into those syst natural systems that replicate the effects that we need as, as organisms ourselves? Yeah. Yeah, and it's tough because the, the, you know our biggest pressures are climate and housing, right? <laughs> There's just not space to have lots more parks and city and, and things in our cities, right? The, the pressure is there for for buildings, but yeah, it's it's about changing changing our notions of of what buildings are as these contained, uh, separating spaces, and and work out ways that we can integrate um, on an urban level with uh, nature, and whether that needs 
the notion of sort of urban and natural corridors through our cities that you know become become this secondary system so you've got the roads and the pedestrian movement but there could also be natural corridors running through cities and and you know city plans might start to develop around these um but it's yeah it's the, the fight for space is always going to be the biggest challenge and that was the whole problem with cities anyway is that too many people were living too closely and that's why infections became such a problem because suddenly we went from you know being hunter gatherers living in a few groups to suddenly getting these crowd infections of living together so you know i th these challenges in order to design what is a healthy city um for me need to be just as important as climatic discourse mm. Well, it's this, there's this new term, isn't there? Green infrastructure, which people, are, planners in particular, are starting to use, but which they normally mean just open green space or green space you can see rather than sort of the, the systems approach, like we've been saying. But I sort of, I mean, it's great that we're, we're sort of saying, oh, we should do this, we should do that. But how, how do we actually incentivize the people who are, do, are building the buildings and, and designing the buildings and commissioning the buildings to actually integrate these things in the first place. Like what's going to incentivize people to want to integrate biological elements with architectural elements and <laughs> urban planning elements? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think in many ways you shouldn't have to argue that a healthy space should be <laughs> should, should need any of that should you but you know th there's been sort of various strategies haven't there of you know stop making sure the lift stops at every other floor so that people have to walk up one flight of stairs and if you've heard some of these things <laughs> and you know making people become more active in buildings and things and that's all driven by a health thing but this this exposure to nature and, and this kind of thing i'm not sure it's hit the, the consciousness of, of people yet and maybe it's Maybe it's still waiting for the for the science and the medicine to to really understand what these microbiomes are because we don't really know at the moment. Okay, they've 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 realised sort of how important it is and, and what is good from that point of view, but we, they don't know necessarily enough to say well you need to you know you need to be exposed to these types of microbes because that's good. But what we do know generally is that environmental microbes and soil microbes are are good. Now it's sort of expanding that up into buildings, can we start you know purposely putting those into our buildings? Why not? Again, you know, why why do our spaces in our buildings have to be clean and sterile? You know, that's that's just something that's developed over the last fifty years, when actually we might need to rethink that because there was a time when we weren't making sure everything was sterilised, or we weren't over cleaning, or we weren't using bacterial antibacterial projects that kills ninety nine percent of yeah. bacteria. So, you know, asking asking what's what's the contemporary understanding of of health and cleanliness, and maybe re reshifting our thoughts on that um could be a could be a driver now how does that come into policy and things like that i don't know be, people need to need to i guess start understanding that if if their job involves them being in an office for nine hours a day haven't they got the right that that office is a healthy space and people already think about that but have no real understanding of what it means so the fact that we, we have no choice but to sit in a hermetically sealed building, well, we might realize that that's not a good thing for us, but we have the right to question these decisions when they're done. And yeah, how, how does that happen? I don't know. It's not going to be a policy thing at the moment. But I think once once we start to understand these these conditions more, maybe it's more about the demand of people and the expectations of people that, that will drive changes in the way these, these things are done. Yeah. I, mean, I always think that when you get into that situation where you've got some insane air conditioning system like blasting out recycled air and you're trying to all you want to do is open the window and get a fresh breeze coming through and you can't and it's sort of there's almost architects and especially mechanical and mechanical and electrical engineers are trying to be too clever by half and trying to create these sort of all-knowing systems that are smart and respond but actually all you need what, what is valuable is that human connection yeah. to the sort of the outside world and the environment that you, you sort of exist in yeah there, there was the movement the, the sort of the rhino banham house as a machine that that kind of thing that the mechanized control you know that the technology really sort of changed how we did that but we might need to we might need to question some of that and again it comes back to again the, the how much control do you want over these things and how much energy do you want to put into controlling these things and you know just just to call something smart smart doesn't mean healthy right it's not smart doesn't mean necessarily good uh from from, from an everyday health perspective mm. have you have you heard of these um fecal transplants 
Fecal transplants. Yeah, we heard of these poo poo transplants. Oh right, when people get poo put in their their gut Into systems their guts. to yeah yeah I have actually. Yeah. And maybe architecture needs a, a fecal transplant. I don't know. They say <laughs> they, they do say that before before kids are going to be given antibiotics, that that you might take a poo sample, give them the antibiotics because the antibiotics kill everything inside them, right? Even the yeah, bacteria, yeah. and then put it back in. Maybe that's what arch architecture needs. Maybe architecture needs a poo transplant. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's well. You, I mean, you're the you're the one in education. Do you think that students are taught enough about the importance of biological integration or biological systems? within their designs i mean i don't know i think i think it you know certainly within a space such as the bartlett you know you can have those kind of kind of conversations but it's not in every in every group and and i think it would only be quite niche small small sets of us that do that at the moment i mean i think the bio the bio design uh community is growing and i think this is a small subset of that so it's not that there's there's huge number of groups looking at this stuff around the world mm. but it's definitely yeah i mean of course it's it's definitely an agenda that needs looking at yeah, well, I mean, I'd sort of say, could it even become as important as having a mechanical and electrical engineer on a, on a project or a structural engineer? Like, you have to consider the the biological impact or the biological and and sort of e ecological integration of a, of a building into yeah, its context. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see that. I mean, there, there was always the drive around. You know, remember when sick building syndrome became a, a bit of a kind of a, a mainstream thing, and, and people became very aware of sort of the negative effects of of certain things in buildings to do with actually to do with molds and, and funguses and things like that and you know i think moisture was always a big problem in buildings that, that related to some of this but obviously now we're understanding that there's there's good sides of this too and yeah absolutely i, I think there should definitely be a, a biologist or a microbiologist um they, they've had a shift in in technologies in that industry as well now whereas the, the microbiology within buildings was always done through sort of culturing taking samples around and going put it back on a plate in the laboratory whereas these things called now called dna sequencing uh, where you can literally take a swab and run it through a, a sort of high throughput um, system and, and all of a sudden you realize how much of this stuff is there so this stuff is already there anyway uh, we just tend not to see it right um, but what this means is is we can we can start to think about design interventions and we can actually start to monitor the changes um, and so that that from my point would would be um, an interesting thing to do is start to ask how our architectural design choices are changing the microbiology of our spaces and so in the same way as you might have yeah a structural engineer or a you know you start with a building survey well you might actually start with a microbial survey of a building to understand what's there and what potential changes you might need to make for that to encourage certain parts of it to prevent other parts of it that that for me would be a, an interesting an interesting future yeah, well, it's the sort of thing that there almost, it almost has to be mandated by statute, doesn't it? Because it's it's not something that any client's going to say, going to sort of get value from on an obvious level, certainly. No, for sure. But again, if it comes down to the people that are living there demanding for healthy spaces, once we start to better understand these things, maybe it becomes becomes driven by the people who are buying or, or using mm. these spaces. Well, you could almost have like in the way that you have for energy efficiency ratings yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Why not have a, a bio receptivity or bio biodiversity rating mm. of a building, and that would allow people to at least see what it is that they're the architecture that's they're about to inhabit. Well, again, it's at the moment it's all driven by problems, isn't it? So if there's certain gases in the ground, is it radon and things like that in the ground? You have to know about that if you're if you're buying your house or building on a site, right? And actually, understanding and knowing what kind of the the, the the natural condition of a site is and designing upwards from that um, would be a way to start start discussing this. Yeah, I think there's sort of a bureaucratic uh, obstacle as well, isn't there? I mean, the classic idea of having to have like a newt survey that lasts 18 months or something and they stops the build. Yeah. They see all these little fences up around all the developments by roads and things that yes. they have to leave there yeah. for X number of months. And if there's one newt, they have to leave it. Oh, I don't know how it works, but yeah, for sure, the developers are not going to want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the thing is you have to you have to find ways of incentivizing them to make them want to, mm. ideally, uh, rather than trying to sort of force them to in one way or another. Um, but yeah, in terms of the technology side of it, mm. you've done a lot of work with obviously digital production, yep. and manufacturing, three D printing, that kind of thing. Is there a, a sort of a cross a, a cross disciplinary role between the biological sort of stuff in architecture and the digital stuff? Do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's 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 all related. It's not that um, necessarily these these technologies have, have have changed the way of thinking, but it just allows you to explore uh, geometries quicker, for example, and certain types of geometries that were very hard to fabricate before. 
you know, now you can very quickly do them through 3D printing or, you know, seven axis milling or things like that. Um, does it directly change from a biological perspective? Not, not really, but it, it certainly has, has allowed us to explore more complexity than perhaps we've been able to do in the past. Mm. And do you think that's, is that going to become as mainstream as a, people seem to be advertising that it will? Because I see there's sort of a, a strong academic role for these sorts of technologies, but they're yet to find their niche in actual sort of in the market effectively mm. in of, of producing architecture yeah i mean pe people say that the construction industry is like t 20 years behind the sort of car manufacturing industries um and so people have always looked to these these kind of automated factories they're using robots and, and asked what how can we do architecture in this way um, and things also go through trends you know 3, 3d printing had its real kind of boom time when it when it first kind of really emerged um and then it kind of slowed down for for a number of reasons. Materially, it, it, you know, plastics and things like that that you could do in small machines in a three D print facility didn't really ever translate up to a building. Um, and so there's there's been a real big push in the industry to to question what three D printing sort of can be for for buildings. And so what you saw from then is people trying to do more traditional materials. So concrete, three D printing concrete has become a big kind of driver and ways to escape the box 3d printing was always limited by the the 3d printing box yeah you could do small pieces but you, you can't do a whole building that way and so people then look to sort of robot arms to be able to escape from the box and development of nozzles to extrude concretes and all, all these things and so that's really been sort of driving that side of it and you know there there, there are big effectively big 3d print machines now that can that can 3d print houses in concrete uh, I'm not sure what, what people think of them, but they're not—they're not generally sort of seen particularly uh, strongly architecturally at the moment. But mm. I think the technology is still, in, in many ways, is still quite early. Although they've been around for sort of five or six years doing this stuff, they're still quite a long way from from being mainstream. Um, but I think as as the various you know construction companies do adopt these technologies, I, I definitely think it will be playing a much bigger role. Uh, in in the future, um, there's still a big sort of, uh, I guess, divide of whether sort of on-site fabrication or off-site fabrication is is the way forward. And there are certain people that believe for for sort of heavily urban areas, sort of on-site fabrication is just too dangerous, risky, and expensive. And so, you know, if you if you're talking about an off-site fabrication, well, then you can do these things in a in a in a very controlled way. Mm. Um, on-site fabrication using these type of technologies seems a long way off because of the realities of doing buildings this way. Yeah, it seems to me that there's a sort of misunderstanding or misuse of the purpose of them as well. Like the the main benefits of things like um, the seven axis milling or three D printing is the sort of mass customization that you can have at the same cost, rather than I mean you look at you mentioned the sort of three D printing in concrete, and obviously China has done large amounts of this of standard square panels for standard boring buildings three D printing, and you're thinking. Well, why? Why you're you're not getting the benefits of the technology you're using? You're just doing it for the sake of it in a way, and maybe they're doing it for like the development reasons or research reasons. But it seems to me that in terms of the biological integration, what you can do is you can use algorithms to determine, say, the best forms on a particular site in particular conditions to allow bioreceptivity in that particular ecology, and then produce those either on-site or off-site, using, say, 3D printing. And you get the completely unique forms based on whatever site it is that you're on in any particular case. And no one seems to be sort of doing that particularly yet. Yeah, I'm not sure what directly 3D printed elements are go are can go straight onto buildings at the moment. I'm not sure it, it still exists. People, funnily enough, still go back to sort of casting panels and, and, and things like that. So I'm not sure the technology is there to be able to do that yet. I definitely think that that is is the right use of the technology. But I, I'm, funnily enough, it's it still seems quite a long way away from that mm. because to do with strength, to do with the, the resilience of these pieces, a lot, a lot of sort of the, the sort of larger 3D printed elements that you see from academia into some of the sort of early tests in, in the construction industry i still think they're a long way from actually being used on buildings yeah well there's those guys in the netherlands that have just printed that um bridge and metal mm -hmm. haven't they yeah which is uh, again biological forms based on a, a particular context of a canal yeah um but it's taken months and months and months and months to print <laughs> with a couple of robotic arms um and yeah it's <laughs> I think the philosophy behind the two 
the two things, the biological and the digital, is pretty much the same in terms of that sort of context level specificity, I suppose, um, that you can achieve. But there's, like you say, there's sort of a, there's a, a lag at the moment of anyone actually applying it, and and I'm struggling to see where there's a sort of a market opportunity for it. Like who's going, who who's worthwhile is it to actually invest in using that kind of technology in one way or another? I think it's a valid point. I mean, if there's no market for the the, the companies are not gonna not gonna develop the technology. But there, there is there is some some interesting groups. I mean, Lango Rock, for example, are, are a company who've invested a huge amount in automation and, and technology uh, as, a, as a construction company. Um, and they were doing some really interesting things with uh, 3D printing wax molds uh, that could then be cast into, and then the wax can just be reused, melted down and reused. So it became, took away the sort of the expensive expense system in, in making molds. But funnily enough, I, I still don't think they were uh, they were interested in directly 3D printing some of these elements, um, and you know they're they're a fairly big company, so even smaller companies, I'm not sure how they could justify uh, sort of the expenditure on these kind of systems when there's no real market for it at the moment. Mm. Well, that's that's sort of the classic problem of natural capital, really, isn't it? That you can you have your measurable product that you can sell and your measurable natural resources that go into your measurable product mm -hmm. but the sort of the ecological either damage or cost or anything like that is completely unmeasurable in a way and the, is there i mean through your own research have you found sort of ways of measuring the the biological value or, or diversity or, or prosperity that might be applicable. Yeah, I mean, it's something we're interested in. But again, we've steered away from trying to put figures on these things at the moment because we believe that if you if you if you follow the figures too much, you get into much more of an engineering solution because you're always trying to maximise, which goes against a bit of some of the principles we've already discussed of just accepting what what nature does, what its niches are. Um, the other thing is obviously is the scale again, and talking about sort of on-site and off-site fabrication, a lot of biological integration might need a sort of more of a nursery period approach where you might be able to integrate living systems but you might need to grow them in a kind of controlled way first in much more of an off-site fabrication and then take them onto buildings i'm not sure this doing it all on site mm. exists so could you have a almost a building nursery in the same way that you have exactly, a plant right? nursery that yeah. you grow them you could be growing your panels with your mosses or whatever it is on it and, yeah. and then place yeah. them in a, in a pre-established state exactly it must be an, ex an extra step in the fabrication process mm. because again even even though we're talking about using plants and living systems you still have to harvest these from somewhere to be able to grow them there's still a cost involved and there's still a, a level of uh, i mean laboratory laboratory approaches to things are quite expensive yeah and i think there's sort of a there's a like we said earlier a sanitization of nature as well that you've people are very keen on including these sort of natural elements. I mean, trees is the perfect example where you get a uh, sort of everyone's keep breaking on putting trees all over the place, but then they're set in these boxes that are underground and you're with these root barriers and you must not go outside the root barrier and everything is, has to be exactly prescribed. And then after sort of five, 10 years or something, someone goes, comes along and lops the top off and says, you are not allowed to grow beyond this point. We are restricting you. Yeah. And that, and that goes against that sort of, messy philosophy or, or looser philosophy of allowing nature to exist in its own state yeah i mean we've been a bit against some of the i'm sure you've seen some of the proposals uh, of sort of putting trees all over skyscrapers and things like that you know we've been we've been we've been a bit sort of critical of, of that because just because of the energy it needs to do that kind of thing and so this you know literal taking of nature and just putting it onto buildings and then creating your zones and growth areas. It, it's not something I don't, I don't think it works when you when you literally just transport it on. It's got to be done in in a in a bottom up way. Yeah, I mean, you think about the kinds of of um, organisms that would exist naturally at that sort of in that environment. Mm -hmm. Like a, an oak tree is not one of them, really, is it? No. So if, uh, I'm of the philosophy that if you by all means put something on a building but it should be able to exist by itself until the end of time mm -hmm. and it should with no intervention no watering no feeding nothing and it should just be able to exist and if yeah. it doesn't then that's just part of nature and and you've done your calculations wrong effectively <laughs> i mean the other side of this is to, is to consider um, a lot of materials that are existing now that people are actually growing the materials so this is like an extra step moving away from using 
sort of existing architectural material. So we've done a lot of work with concrete or different mixes of concrete that can allow growth happen. But there's a big movement now in actually growing your own material. So I'm sure you've seen some. Have you heard of mycelium? Yeah, so mycelium so. is, a, is a type of mushroom fungi that you can grow into into molds really and it produces this quite dense it's a bit similar to sort of insulating material um, but there are many others sort of um, biocellulose for example you can grow certain cellulose materials from bacterial cultures and so this idea that of biomaterials not not in the sense of coming from um, a non uh, petrol source because we have bioplastics which are not really bio actually they're just really use. well bio biomaterials often sounds very healthy doesn't it and very good but in in the loosest term it just means that they don't come from petroleum based things there's nothing actually living in them but there is a movement within the bio design agenda to actually grow materials and they, i guess this sort of continues like, a bit like wood you mean <laughs> well, like like wood, yeah, yeah, exactly like wood. But there is a a, a, it's a material uh, based design process where you actually grow your own sort of different types of materials, and and more and more architects are starting to look at this now. So it moves away from the from the notion of just going to a materials library and specifying certain materials for building to actually think about growing your own materials. Mm. Now this this furthers the whole conversation of you know. How, how do you trust to put these materials onto buildings when you've somebody's literally made them in their kitchen or something like that but we might also consider how long we want our buildings to last for um, and it's a tough conversation to have because pe people have different opinions on it and you know cheap buildings that don't very last very long have always been seen as a bad thing but actually might we need to reconsider um, what we mean from buildings in terms of their permanence is is a hundred years for a building a good thing could we think about things differently where perhaps buildings don't last that long or parts of buildings don't last that long and brings into it a much more cyclical nature of rebuilding parts of buildings on a more regular basis if it can be done in a sustainable way that doesn't cost a huge amount in a bit way that nature does you know if a, tree, if a tree doesn't need part of its tree it lets itself die off right or you know na nature works in this way corals are a very good example if there's part of a coral gets ill it it effectively the rest of the coral cuts itself off so it doesn't send any nutrients then could we think about buildings in that way where we accept that as buildings change over time or that the need for the building changes over time could we actually allow parts of that to just decay away and we rebuild based on a new typology or, or use for the building mm. it's biological without necessarily being living yeah i mean there's in a way i'd say that already happens to some extent and because there's from my point of view that current buildings are not anywhere near designed last designed to last anywhere near long enough mm. i mean most buildings are sort of designed to last 60 years or something at the moment whereas sort of 100 years ago 200 years ago the buildings that they've got are still around yep. to a large extent even if they've been been redeveloped or re, re sort of renovated mm. i think you're right that there is definitely a role for making a clearer distinction between which bits of a building are designed to last a thousand years and which bits are designed to last 20 years mm. say and maybe there is a stronger role for building in that that adaptive change and maybe even using biological systems if possible mm. into buildings whilst maintaining a level of permanence that perhaps say was the scaffold the bio scaffold um and and that maybe we need to make that distinction more whereas it seems to me that a lot of buildings at the moment are wholly designed just to last 60 years mm. And consequently, has to be completely demolished after yeah. that time, yeah. rather than being reused. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I can't talk too much on it because I don't really know. But I, I can't remember what it was. I was reading the other day, but it, it relates to the to, to the sort of common discourse on plastics and, and wasteful materials. And yeah, I, I think sort of lowering the cost of buildings and accepting they don't last so long, if you can do it in a controlled way economically it must work out at some point right there must there must be a way of doing it in, in, in an intelligent way so it's not seen as wasteful but just more seen as a, a as a biological process of saying well it has a set time frame for use and after that time we accept that that's going to need redoing but as long as it doesn't cost a huge amount of money and use too many resources i'm sure it could be a model that could be looked at mm. i mean you talk about um leaving your garden to grow wild you should see out there is it <laughs> much to the annoyance of uh, my guests to like, why haven't you cut your garden yeah. like, it's why would i choose a concrete a load of concrete slabs <laughs> rather than a load of nice plants 
And they're like, oh, well, yeah, but they're weeds. But they're only weeds if you don't want them there. Exactly. So we're at the other stage now. We've just moved into a, a bigger house because we have the family. But obviously, a bigger garden sounds great, but it just needs more upkeep. <laughs> <laughs> I to get into that situation where I'm not somebody who particularly enjoys gardening. And then on the one hand, I'm talking about pro promoting the nat natural condition. But there is definitely a need for some kind of maintenance, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Well, like we said earlier, if you prune the edges, make it look deliberate. Yeah then it's it's suddenly it's a nice offset area mm. of, of wild growth yeah. rather than an unkept garden. Yeah. That's when we when you mentioned about the sort of the Icelandic green roofs buildings that you see where they look they look kind of overgrown, don't they? They look like they need a bit of a haircut. Mm. I think it'd be interesting to see that in a city and how that works in a city. Because it works well in rural conditions, doesn't it? Yeah, not, well that's I've... that's what I meant by the regulatory um constraints on it. Yeah. The, you're not allowed to do that. Like yeah. Building reg says you can't have a roof that overflows like this. You have mm -hmm. to have like a fire break between the edge of the roof and the green roof bit, and yeah. you can't. You've got to have this much soil, and you can't have greenery around like this close to the window and all this kind of stuff. But no, I think I think you're. I would love to see a situation where even ten percent of the built surface area was covered in some form of life. Yeah. Um, and you, need, you need to test this stuff down like by more London or somewhere like that somewhere that's so manicured and sterile that you need one yeah. of these buildings and test these percentages out I don't, I don't know what the percentage is well it's it's. I mean I, there's a great website that shows all the building heights of in various cities Yeah. Um, so you can work out exactly how much surface area there is in a set um, um, amount of city space and it's absolutely huge yeah. there's a vast amount of, of actual surface area mm -hmm. So, which in theory could be biological habitat of some sort. Um, I mean, even as far as I'm concerned, even if you just planted sort of big planters with climbing plants around the edge, sort of outskirts of most buildings, yeah, um, that would absolutely transform the entire space. Well, I mean, there's also huge amounts of sort of what they call like grey infrastructure, right? Just just bare walls and things like that. They're not even buildings that. You know, it's almost like there should be no reason that stuff is not becoming productive to the to the biosphere in some way, right? Even yeah. If, even if it is just a simple algae growing on it, it's still contributing to our carbon cycles. Yeah, well, I always I always laugh when you're um, you get councils and people complaining about graffiti on walls because like if you just replaced it with a hedge, like, you can't graffiti a hedge. You can't graffiti a hedge. <laughs> <laughs> you could try, but it won't work very well. And the, and that sort of thing is just so simple that and it makes such a difference to people's lives. And but people just don't think about it, and they just think, "Oh, just build a wall, just build a fence, all that kind it's, of thing." I don't know. Is it all just ba based on the hardness and and low maintenance? Right, a brick wall doesn't need much maintenance, does it? So yeah. I guess for for council until and someone sprays graffiti on it, and then they have to yeah, go yeah, along, and then yeah, it yeah. needs to be pointing and all this kind. Yeah, of. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think I think you're right. There's a there's a short termism or a view that sort of hard infrastructure is in a way cheaper or easier mm. when actually it might be the opposite is the yeah. case well there's that condition that, uh, i don't know if you've been over to euston from from the bartlett where they've they've basically dug up euston square gardens haven't they at the moment and they've now got the taxi rank on it i have it oh, it's awful and so you've got the basically euston road which is one of the most polluted roads in london mm. and then the other side of it we used to have a park which had quite a fair bit of grass and trees and now it's just Taxi rank. Is it just taxis? So, um, the pollution, God. the pollution walking along there must be must be the worst in London. Yeah, I mean it's nice. The Bartlett itself is nice because it's got that row of trees on the one side. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of it's it's difficult because I mean you think of traditionally beautiful cities. I was I was thought this when I went to both Venice and Siena. They have almost no greenery in them at all. For sure. Yeah. And so it's not a necessary condition of a no. beautiful city. No. I mean, even somewhere like New York has, mm. apart from obviously the big one in the yeah. middle, yeah. Central Park, there's pretty much no green infrastructure at all. Yeah. And so it's, I'd say it's not absolutely necessary, but it could definitely complement an, an urban space a lot if done properly. But it's just a question of how how to do it most effectively yeah. well, I mean they say London is a fairly green city and funny when you look on Google Maps and from above it does look green funnily enough when you're at the street level it doesn't always feel that way no but it also depends how you do it as well I mean it, we've been lucky in a way that the Victorians decided to plant so many trees down mm. all of the residential streets yeah. and yes they cause issues with access and pull up pavements and all this kind of thing but is that's the kind of example of resilience and flexibility and messiness i think we people need to learn to adopt and not get all sort of annoyed about when it gets in the way of their 
push chair or something. Exactly. And you see it a lot in the new developments as well. And when we talk, I mentioned earlier about this notion of sort of urban dysbiosis, right? And separation of nature. So on so a lot of the new developments, they, they do see the need for sort of a, a, a sort of garden conditional barrier condition between the house and the street, but it's done in such a sterile way with a, you know, a small strip of grass and some low maintenance plants. And it's, mm. we have to change our approach to that. I think it's, it, everything doesn't shouldn't always be low maintenance yeah i one of my favorite examples which i initially thought was the cop out but actually i think it's quite good is the use of gabions mm. with, with um ro like the, the rock cages which actually form incredibly complex habitats they do yeah. yeah um and you get mosses growing in them and not insects in them and all these kind of things and they very quickly I and mean, if you look at some of the early examples because they started in sort of the 90s didn't they mm. if you look at the early examples they've actually become really really rich habitats yeah which and they they're sort of a perfect example of a bio scaffold in a way of something that does its job as well as say a concrete wall would, yeah. but actually provides a really really good space where sort of biological and natural elements can integrate quite closely. Well, again, it's an example of when nature is not the green, the, the fluffy green thing. Right, nature is more than that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm doing a project at the moment where we're trying to actually purposely put certain types of bacteria into. Our building surfaces so we're, we're doing this kitchen condition of tiles and purposely put bacteria in there um, and all the work we did before previously with the the moss and the algae i guess one of the things is is you actually see that growth at the end of it and so we were always designing for that aesthetic yet funnily enough when you're designing for bacteria you can have millions and millions of bacteria in a you know in a fairly standard kitchen sized tile but you never see them Mm. So what are the design beyond beyond designing for the species? What what's the aesthetics of these things? What should they look like? Because bacteria are not green plants grow. So there's another question there of what what we want this stuff to look like, you know, that's different from the from the glossy, sterile, clean kitchen that we're we're so keen on. Yeah. What might a kitchen look like that's covered in bacteria? Well, for example, if you put a bioluminescent gene into those same bacteria, suddenly you get everyone's kitchen it would be absolutely covered See, in these now things. I like, now I like your thinking. <laughs> and that, and that would really yeah. a, first freak people out, but then they'd get used to the fact that they had bioluminescent bacteria all over their kitchen. Yeah. And the day that they all suddenly were gone, they'd be like, where have all my, where's my lovely little... And it's funny you say because the biologists, whenever you mention this to biologists, they're like, yeah, yeah, it can be done. It's easy, it's easy. And then it actually comes around to doing it and they're a bit more sceptical to try this stuff. But absolutely, these these kind of... I mean, that's, that's another sort of side of the bio design is a bit more the sort of genetic engineering, genetic modification mm. thing that opens up another conversation of, of whether you deem that as acceptable, natural even... And it's a it's a tough conversation. Some people just don't like it. Yeah, well, it's it's sort of there's a weird distinction between genetic engineering, as we understand the term, and selective breeding, which yep. is effectively genetic engineering, yeah, just done through less been direct done means, doing for thousands and thousands yeah, of years. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I love the idea of bioluminescent trees instead of street lights. Absolutely. Can imagine that; would be amazing. Yeah. I think the whole city would look like Avatar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> but the point is, you can do these as 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 sensors as well. You can have them as biosensors in your house, and you know that if they're glowing, they're healthy, they're alive. So your system is alive, right? It doesn't mm. have to always be done through an app on your phone. It could be done through this kind of quite subtle biological mechanisms. Mm. I'm quite interested in what this interior condition is. If we if we were to consider, if we already know that the interior of this space is covered in bacteria, but to be able to see that in some way and to be able to understand what's going on. It's quite an interesting, interesting idea. Yeah, well, that's the thing is when people talk about natural integration of, of, of biological elements into architecture, it's always external, isn't it? It's always yep. about, uh, apart from the odd sort of fake green wall you get in a, a hotel lobby or, sort of, or yep. some office somewhere, which is artificially fed by a water system. Or something. Yep. It's, it is always an external thought. Whereas is it actually, since we spend so much time indoors, is it more important in a way to focus on the indoor condition? It was a big thing for me why I switched actually because this constant outward looking kind of approach that we're doing while I find it very interesting I was much more interested on the interior condition uh, of what that could potentially be and the funding we got for our research project came through this principle of antimicrobial resistance these, these uh, basically super bugs as they're called in, in, the, in the mainstream media that are no longer responding to our antibiotics and why is that happening and why is it uh, spreading and so rather than taking the sort of the kill all approach and say we need to have everything that's super sterile to kill these things well actually more biological diversity bacterial diversity is a good thing because it actually stops these resistant bugs proliferating as soon as you create a sterile surface if there is any 
pathogens there. They can kind of grow without any sense of competition. So actually, while we might never be quite close to this idea of there are very specific type of bacteria that you have to have, just general bacterial diversity is probably a good thing and something we should allow more for. Yeah. Imagine you've got quite a diverse, a good diverse thing here. You've got some, <laughs> you've got some nice windows. I've got windows. I've got house plants. You've got the plants, and you've got the kitchen. The kitchen. Be, being a Victorian house, I've got a, a regular uh, incursion of mold as well, oh, and that sort well, of thing. Of so. I, I know. About that, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, people people have house plants, obviously, and they're really popular and increasingly. It's, obviously, there's all kinds of benefits of them, but they. Actually, like, they seem such a simple thing, but do they have much more of a role than people actually? sort of give them credit for in a way mm. i think they do yeah and they're, they're learning much more about these these soil microbes so it's you've got to remember that those things are covered in microbes as well and it's all one system so it's not just the plant it's the plant and its microbes and actually the microbes may be doing a lot of the job actually rather than the plant because mm. they, they use certain plants to clean um vocs and things but actually it might be the microbes doing that rather than actually the plant yeah and I think, in ter- obviously, internally, you're going to get the. You're essentially you talking about antimicrobial resistance because that's dealing with the sort of the the childhood discrepancy of not having enough exposure mm. internally. But how does that apply on an external level? Like, do we? How do we integrate that level of biological diversity and and microbial diversity in a way that? children in particular are exposed to regularly outside as well as inside in the, when you're walking along the street how do you change the street layout or the street design to facilitate that yeah that's why i like this idea of these these kind of green corridors through cities which would almost be the kind of circulation of of, of nature and if you could design your your kind of your buildings and spaces around these cities you could have sort of wind directions that's blowing a lot of the kind of stuff from the parks up in a certain direction and then design off of that i mean it's, you can never do this in london right because the the layout already exists but when, when we are talking about new cities and certainly some of these mega cities you know designing designing for these principles is is certainly something that should be happening mm. well i think for me that's the the, the biggest challenge is how do you integrate it with existing cities because mm. it is very easy to say oh well, with your plan i'm going to draw a corridor here and a corridor there and integrate it in um in a way that to an extent was done in the garden cities as well yeah but actually the challenge of integrating that into an existing city where everyone already is because that's the real challenge that's isn't real it challenge, to be honest, yeah. Yeah. is that that's the sort of much more fundamental question of how do you do that yeah, and it's also about again a bit what I was saying about before to do with sealed buildings. It, it, it's not of much benefit if you have a lot of natural biology outside if it can't get inside to the building. That it's not actually beneficial. So we do have to reconsider how these these things get. I mean, the problem, as you say, is living in an older house. You know, you see the negative side of of mold growth and and things. We've got a lot of damp in our house as well. And there's you know there's some serious studies that show that this is in in the worst case this is not a good thing. So it's not quite as simple as saying that let's let's you know suddenly start growing stuff in our houses and that's going to be good. So that, as I say, we are very dependent on I think the medical uh, uh, communities better understanding this stuff. But as designers, we can still design and speculate and question how we might do things differently based on these these kind of conversations. Awesome. Well, on that note, I'm sure we'll uh, both continue our research into it. And uh, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very much. Cheers.